Okay, thank you. So uh, I don't know who's helping me with the PowerPoint presentation, if it can come up. Uh, for, but let me just start. I want to thank Harish. I want to th thank everybody responsible here at HR Milestone uh, you know, for giving me an opportunity. It's always great to connect with Harish. Um, he's got that kind of enthusiasm and passion, never sits quiet, wants to do something. And um, even during this COVID issue, I'm so glad that we are doing something like this on a daily basis. And let me tell you, doing this on a daily basis is not easy. So I want to really give everybody a big round of applause. Um, I'm going to clap for you guys um, for putting this uh, to on a daily basis is not a joke. So thank you so much for doing that and engaging the HR audience. And I thank you for this time. Uh, I wanted to, um, in fact, I titled this, uh, the, um, uh, the program as getting the best out of your employees. You won't see that in my opening slide for a particular reason, because this is what I'm going to cover. Um, but you will see it unfold as we move on. I also try uh, try to bring in menti.com, but I think with this technology, uh, there could be a challenge. So we might just ask you to give your comments. Uh, so at, point, at some point in time, I'll pause and ask you to give your uh, responses to some questions that I have. Uh, I'm, I'm still not that technologically advanced to get Menti and share my screen, but uh, I don't want to do something which will delay the whole process. But thank you so much for being here. Uh, I'd like to start with this whole uh, thing that you're seeing on slides. Start with talents and finish with strengths. Um, and uh, I just want to tell everybody on this call today, whatever you do, whoever you are, you are born with a talent. Now, you got to understand this. You are born. You, you can't look at somebody and say, oh my God, John is playing the saxophone. He's got more talents than me. That is wrong. You have a talent. You got to look yourself in the mirror every day and tell yourself that you have been gifted by God at least with one talent. Everybody on earth here in this world has at least one talent. You're born with it, but you can't sit on it. Many people, first of all, are not even aware of what their talents are. Secondly, if they're aware, they sit on it. They basically don't do anything about it. So I'm going to start with this whole concept of understanding what talent is and how do you finish it as to making your strength. On the slide, you'll see my top five talents. Now, this is coming out of the Strengths Finder research, um, and I'm going to talk about this a little later. My top talents are positivity, ideation, connectedness, empathy, and futuristic. That's my top five. Um, how, how does it help? Uh, the best way that I can think of is, you know, in Reliance, we had a position for, uh, you know, a promotion. And uh, I applied for that position. And what is uh, an interview going to ask you at the interview for sure? He's going to ask you, can you tell us something about your strengths and weaknesses? What do you think I've, I went on to say? I, wanted, I went on to talk about these five top strengths of mine. I said, I've got positivity. I can energize people when I come into a room. I can light up the atmosphere when I come into a group of people. I ideate. I can't sit quiet. I have one idea. Then the next idea, I can keep thinking of ideas. And I started rattling all my five top strengths or talents, I should say, in that interview. And believe it or not, I was saying it out of conviction because that is who I am. And many times when we go for interviews, when this question is asked, what's your uh, talents or strengths, you immediately come out with some great answer for that particular interview. And for the next interview, it is not the same you know, strengths that you talk about. Uh, and therefore, you're cooking up new things. And so I, I, I just want to talk about this uh, in terms of uh, what my top uh, five strengths are. And I'll talk more about this as we move into Strengths Finder a little later. But I want to start with this. We can move on to the next slide. And uh, the next slide talks about how unique you and I are. Uh, each of us are uniquely uh, made. When I say uniquely made, there's no two people who are the same. I know this is a virtual meeting and we don't get to see each other as much as we possibly do in a classroom session but you know that there are people in your house you may have a brother or sister you may even have a twin uh, that particular person is not going to be the same as you that person is not going to think like you that person is not going to act like you that person is completely unique to you and you are unique to them 
Uh, and you got to understand the power of this uniqueness. And the reason why I'm saying this is because it's one of my favorite subjects. I get very excited when I speak about uniqueness of people. Uh, because you see, in a 7 billion population here on planet Earth, there's only one person like you and there's only one person like me. There's nobody else in this world who, who looks like you or acts like you, thinks like you, not a soul. Now, if that does not get you excited, I don't know what will get you excited. When I think of that, that I'm only one in seven billion, I really get excited because there's nobody else who, who's like me. Uh, and so, you know, my favorite motivational speaker is a gentleman by the name of You know, he literally achieved nothing. Uh, but after 45, his career graph just took off. Um, he joined um, one of uh, a major corporations in the United States of America as a, in a 7,000 sales company. He was one of the salesmen. And then year two, he became the number two salesman in that 7,000 sales company. How do you become that? How do you, uh, how do you end up being not so good for 45 years and in the 47th year, you peak to be the best. You know, what happened is he had a boss who, um, who one day looked at Ziegler and said, Ziegler, I've never met a waste like you. I've never met a waste like you. Can you imagine a boss telling you that? But thank God this man did not stop with that. He said, Ziegler, I've never met a waste like you. I've seen you come daily. I've seen, you, I've seen your commitment. I've seen you taking part in training programs. I've seen you taking down notes. I've seen you being very diligent and uh, constantly asking questions and participating in training programs. I've seen you attend almost all training programs. I see the way you have learned so much in the last one year. Ziegler, you've got great potential. And I think you can go to the top. That's what his boss told him. When he heard those words of Mr. Miller, I think that's what his name was, is Mr. Miller, who was his hero. When Mr. Miller told him that, looking at Ziegler, he, he did not know what hit him. The next thing is Ziegler started to perform like no other, and he ended up being the second best salesman in the 7,000 sales company. That is Ziegler. But the fact is, he made a comment a few years ago before he died, and I love what he said. He said every third person in this world is either extremely beautiful, wonderfully handsome, or entirely creative. Every third person in this world is extremely beautiful, wonderfully handsome, or entirely creative. Now, I, know, I don't know whether there's anybody sitting next to you on the left or right, but assume that there's somebody sitting to the left or right to you. Now, look at the person to the left of you and tell them it can't be you. I know somebody uh, has been waiting for 20 years to say that. Go ahead and tell them that. Now, look at the person to the right of you and tell them it can't be you also. And so... You know, you've discounted the person on the left. You've discounted the person on the right. Who is the third person? The third person is you. You are dead center. You are the most beautiful. You are the most creative. You are the most handsome person on God's earth. Don't let anybody tell you you are useless. We are growing up in a society where people love to tell the other person, you are not as good as me. You are useless. Unfortunately, we are hearing this in our houses. Unfortunately, we are hearing this in our offices. Unfortunately, we are hearing this in our companies that you are useless. Now, that's not going to do anything good for people. You've got to tell people you are wonderful. You are unique. When you look at somebody and tell them that you are unique, you're wonderful, I can guarantee you that you will see how their worldview changes. Try telling your children you're useless. What do you think is going to happen? They're going to go spiraling down. But tell them that you are wonderful. You are fantastic. You are great. Even if they make something so small, something insignificant, when you praise them, you, you take them to a higher level. And that's interesting. But I want to talk about this whole concept of uniqueness. There's nobody else in this world who can think like you, act like you, and behave like you. Now, let's move on to the next slide. And uh, you'll see, you know, in the world around us, Everything is unique. Everything that we see is unique. Um, are we able to go to the next slide? I don't know who's controlling it. Are we? Here? Yeah, I think it's moving slowly. Let's move on to the next slide. And so, if you really look at nature and if you look at the world around us, everything around us is unique. You know, if you really look at it, and look at this picture. It's such a beautiful picture of two zebras. 
It could be a mother zebra with a layer, colt uh, of a zebra, right? Now, if you see the African wild, you will see thousands upon thousands of zebras in the green pastures. If this little baby zebra gets lost in those thousands of zebras, all right, it can identify its mother and its father just by the stripes and come back to it. Now, to our eyes, those zebra stripes are the same. It's just the same for us. I mean, look at the stripes. It looks very much the same. But the little zebra can spot its mother, can spot its father, just by the stripes on its body. Every stripe in a zebra is unique. They're like very much that all of us know, our, our fingerprints are unique. Our retina prints are unique. Our tongue impressions or tongue imprints are, are unique. Everything around us is unique. If you go out and take a walk and you go to the leaves of the trees, you will see that no two leaves are the same. Everything is unique. It has a unique blend and uh, texture to it. And that's what we need to understand, that we need to celebrate our uniqueness. Unfortunately, you know, we're not celebrating our uniqueness much, and that's, that is a problem. And so I have a question for you in the next slide, and the question is, in all what is happening around us. How do you define yourself? How do you define yourself? You know, um, how do you stand out? How do you stay separate from the rest of the world? How do you define yourself and how do you allow the world to define you? You know, I've seen this many a times that uh, if we go for a party or if you're in a company, um, you know, get together and if you have to introduce yourself, the very First thing that you would say is, my name is so-and-so, and I'm a vice president with Reliance. No, is that your identity? Is that how you get defined? Is that how the world defines you? Or is that, is that just one element of you? And so we need to understand, how do you get defined? How do you get defined? How, how do people, how do people, how do you have a personal brand around yourself? Do, do people look at you and say, oh, okay, John. Immediately when they think of John, they can think of something about him. Do they think the same about, about you? Right? And this is basically what we need to ask ourselves. Now, I think Paresh was asking whether we can do a PPD mode. Unfortunately, Paresh, we don't have a PPD, the PDF mode, so you may have to just bear with us. And so um, um, I want to just tell us a quick story here, uh, which I heard. Uh, let, let's stay in that same slide uh, uh, let's stay on the same slide. So if you really look at that, uh, you know, uh, the story of a girl and, uh, you know, this girl was in Colombia and uh, she was just four years old, just four years old. And this girl was uh, playing with her friends in Colombia. And uh, you know that Colombia is rife with a lot of drugs and cartels. And it has got a lot of uh, issues with uh, all that stuff happening in that land. So this girl was playing with her friends in, in Colombia in a, in a house and all of a sudden a guy kidnaps her. Four years old, four years old girl and she gets kidnapped. And the next thing that she knows, she is now dropped to be, to, to be dead in the deepest jungles of Colombia. Four year old, dumped to die in Colombian forest. And uh, but when she's sort of coming back to her senses because she was kidnapped and she was unconscious and now she's coming back to her conscience, she wakes up to see herself in, in a completely different environment. And she begins to cry. She cries. She, she cries to her loudest possible. She's calling for a mother. She's calling for a father. She's calling for everybody possible. But there's no response. And so uh, she cries and cries and cries. And after some time, she knows... Uh, that something worse is going to happen because now that she's a little girl, but she can see the sun set on that, on that day and the sun setting. And sooner or later, it's going to be pitch dark in that forest. And looking at that, she cries even more because she now knows when the sun sets, she wouldn't know whether it's going to be a python, a lion, a tiger, as uh, come her way to finish her off. Thinking about that, she starts to crying again and she actually exhausts herself to sleep. And so now she is sleeping the night, hasn't eaten for a few hours, just a sheer exhaustion, she goes to sleep. Early in the morning, she's waking to some strange noises. And the strange noise basically 
uh, is coming from the trees and she does not know what's happening. There's little light in the forest and so the, it's about dawn and she opens her eyes to see a few things moving from branch to branch. And she sees, the, uh, at some point of time, she can see some, some creatures jumping from tree to tree. And then she suddenly realizes those are wild monkeys. And they are moving from tree to tree and doing all these acrobatics because they have seen somebody who is an alien in the forest and they are not happy about it. She see, they see this little girl and they're not happy about it. So some monkeys are angry. Some monkeys are, are, are showing their uh, you know, fangs and teeth and all of that in anger. Some monkeys uh, have the audacity to come down the trees and they come and touch the girl's hair. They come and touch her cheek. They come and touch her hand and her feet. But because of the sheer fright, this girl does nothing but stand like a wax model. She stands like a model, not moving and battling an eyelid. And so she does nothing. And so the monkeys know that she's harmless and leaves the girl alone and goes back. And that, uh, uh, on that day, when the monkeys go back, she's now not eaten for a few hours. She's extremely hungry. But thankfully, when she looks down on the forest floor, those monkeys who came to touch her brought some nuts and berries and fruits with them to eat. And they left them back on the forest floor. And she, she lives on that fruit for that day. Next day morning, these same monkeys come again. Again, some monkeys come and try and touch her and she stands still. And again, thankfully, those monkeys bring some nuts and berries and fruits. And now this little girl is smart enough. She's saying, okay, I want to figure out where these monkeys are getting the nuts and berries and fruits. So let me follow the monkeys. And so when the monkeys climb back to the trees, she follows the monkeys. In a few days, she's now starting to climb trees. In a matter of a few weeks, she becomes an adept climber of trees. And she's moving from tree to tree, knowing exactly what fruit to pluck and what fruit to eat, because now she's adapted herself to her environment. She comes in at the age of four. She stays in that jungle for 10 long years with no, phys no contact of another human being in the jungle for 10 years. Now, this is a real life story. I'm not telling you a, a fairy tale. It is a real life story. Can you imagine a girl who comes into a forest at four, stays in the jungle for 10 long years. One day she's moving from tree to tree. She sees something on the floor of the forest which is extremely shiny. And she's saying, what is that? And she comes down. She thinks it's something edible. She takes it, bites it. And she's not able to bite it. She throws it back. And she's about to turn when the sun's rays hit it one more time. This time, it is even more brighter than before. And the light out of it is so great that she wants to take it once again. And she brings it back for the first time. In 10 years, she brings that piece across her face. She sees two eyes staring at her. And she throws it out in fright. Because she's never seen herself in 10 years. This was the first time she's seeing herself. It was a piece of a mirror, a broken mirror, that she got to see her own self in, her, in, a, in an image. She saw two eyes staring at her, and she throws it down. But she made a comment, and this is the comment she said. I know, I don't know who I am, but I certainly know I'm not a monkey. Let me repeat that again. This is what she said. I don't know who I am, but I certainly know I'm not a monkey. And then the person who's telling the story says, many of us are like that. We are also jumping from tree to tree. We are also going from forest to forest. We are also going from company to company. We are doing everything the world is doing, but we seldom stop and look ourselves in the mirror and ask this question, who am I? Who am I? Do I have a good definition of who I am? Am I somebody who is aping everybody else? Or do I have an identity all by myself? When you walk into the office, do you have an identity of who you are and you, your personal brand speaks volumes for you? Do they know who you are or you just are one of the thousand people who come into your refinery or factory? Are you somebody who stands out? Do you have a personal brand? It's so much with me that you, you and something different in me which I want to bless others with. And so that story was great. And that the girl with no name, uh, her, her name actually is Maria Chapman. She now lives in England. She's a grandmother right now. She's got a daughter. She daughter's got children. Her favorite pastime is to teach her grandchildren climb trees and jump from tree to tree in England. Can you imagine? 
a real life story like that. So how do you define yourself? Let me move on to the next, I think the slide is already there. How do you get the best out of your employees? And that's basically our subject today. So I want to, a few of you to respond, open up your mics um, maybe, and just give me a response. How do you get the best out of your employees? What do you do as a leader, manager? How do you get the best out of your employees? Empower. Give them an environment where they can thrive. Okay, thank you. Somebody else? Empower them. Empower them. Okay, great. Some more? Okay, so can, can I get some more responses? How do you get the best out of your employees? To motivate them. Motivate them. Okay, great. Yes. Treat them with the empathy and equality. Treat them with the empathy and equality. Okay, great. So all of you. Uh, sir, to give them a space of what they can do. And so they can come up with their uh, whatever skills they have. So, you know, they can get it comfortable. Okay, thank you. All right. So let's so move on more back to, to new to people. To, to, to challenge them. Okay, challenge them. Thank you. Thank you. So All right, I'm getting a lot of responses. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so that you are much okay, that's a challenge with, I think, multiple people speaking. Anyway, uh, may I request you to go on mute? I think all of you are right. I want to share in our next slide a study that's been done in terms of how to bring the best out of human beings. So, Aditi, can we move on to the next slide and uh, show us the next slide on this? So, if you see the evolution of the study of human beings and study of human behavior, you know, early in the, in the early 80s, late 80s and early 90s, there was a study by, by a gentleman called Dr. Howard Gardner. Now, he basically came up with this theory of multiple intelligences. So he basically said that human beings are blessed with multiple intelligences. Human beings are not just intelligent in maths, physics, chemistry, English, but they have multiple intelligences. So let me explain what that is. Now, when you think of Lata Mangeshkar, what was her intelligence about? It was singing. When you think of A.R. Rahman, what do you think his intelligence is? It is composing of music. What do you think is the intelligence of Usain Bolt? His intelligence is running. Now, none of these people that I just quoted, we have a clue how much they've studied, what were they good in school, college, are they good in maths, physics, chemistry, English? It doesn't matter because they were good in, in one area, which is an intelligent area for them that they sort of leveraged in. For example, some of you possibly know, I never heard of, uh, you know, composers called Bach and Beethoven and Mozart and all of those. What are these people doing when they were alive? They were composing Western classical music. What are they doing now? Well, you might be thinking, let me give you the answer. They are now decomposing. Now you'll get that joke over dinner, don't worry. Because when they were alive, they were composing. Now they're dead and therefore they're decomposing. So you'll get that joke over dinner, don't worry. Uh, so let me move on. So people are blessed with multiple intelligences. So each of us have got multiple intelligence also. So apart from the fact that we are good in maths so or physics or chemistry, you're also good in other things. You might be good in relationship building. You might be fantastic when it comes to cooking. You might be brilliant when it comes to music. You might be good in composing music. You could be good in writing poetry. You could be wonderful in writing lyrics. I don't know what, but human beings have multiple intelligences. You've got to understand that. So when you look at your children, don't look at them as good in maths, physics, chemistry, engineer, doctor, engineer, doctor, engineer, doctor, no. They have multiple intelligences. See what you can get them to. Number two, the wave that happened after that was a wave that Daniel Goldman picked up from Europe and made it big in the United States of America. It's basically called emotional intelligence. He basically came up with a theory saying, as high that you climb in the ladder of success in the corporate environment, more you need emotional intelligence than intellectual uh, domain, so domain intelligence or technical expertise. And that's so true in our world today. Now, though we need technical expertise and though we, though we need domain expertise, the more you climb the ladder of success, I need to know how to relate with people. I need to know how to connect emotionally with people. There's no point being technically great, but if I'm a bad manager, I'm losing everything. 
So I have to be good in my emotional intelligence and connect with people. Uh, uh, sometime in the early 2000s, we had uh, Marcus Buckingham, who basically was part of the Gallup organization. He came up with a book and he introduced the Strengths Finder at that point of time. And we're going to talk of strengths a little later. And Dr. Ken Blanchard took it one step further, which we tried our hands on in HCL when I was working with Anand Pillay. We did something called the passion assessment. Now, if you understand the passion of a particular person, you will see that passionate people are going to be much more productive than the average person. Uh, if you work with anybody who's passionate, you know, um, you know, in Reliance, we are thankful that we have passionate leaders running the company. And you, uh, the beauty about passion, and I'm going to share that in a little bit. Um, Aditi, you can move on to the next slide for us. Uh, look at this guy's passion. You know, this guy's passion is just unbelievable. Uh, you pay me $1 million also, I wouldn't want to do this. Look at this guy's smile. How can you smile at 15,000 feet? Because you see, can you see that string right on top? If that snaps, it could be famous last words. And the famous last words for this man is, oops, my parachute is not opening. And so I don't know how you can smile at 15,000, 20,000 feet in the air, but for him, it is an area of passion. My question to you is, what is your area of passion? That when you're in that zone, you will smile and will make the world smile with you. Because that is something that you need to identify. And they went on to do some research, and you can go on to the next slide. When you get to the research of passion, they found out that people with passion have a few things in common. They, they found out that people with passion live long lives. People with passion are going to be healthier people. People with passion are going to be happier people. People with passion are going to be productive people. And people with passion, I love that last point, are reproductive as well. And, uh, and then the first time I heard that, I, I was wondering, what is that? So my mentor and my coach at that point of time was Anand Pillai. So he said there are two aspects of reproductivity. One was from the medical side of things. They found out when couples get married and if they don't have children over a period of time, and they found out if one of the spouse or both of them are passionate about what they do, chances of them having children are that much more higher. That's on the medical side of things. The other thing of reproductivity is, It's coming to the workplace every day. What percentage of employees do you think are engaged at work? Can you give me a number? Less than 10%. Less than 10% says Rajiv. And I think that Rajiv is from Reliance. Okay. Um, go, ahead, go ahead. Can I get some more responses? 30% sir. Sunita here. Sunita, 30% engaged. Okay. Now I'm looking at the world population. What is the world population of engaged coming to work, engaged employees? Okay, let's hear one or two more before uh, I So, continue. according to my company's recent survey, it is 93%. Yeah. 93%. Gauri, yes. uh, can you give us your company name and address so that we can start applying to your company? Yeah, please. <laughs> I'm from India, Factoring and Finance. Oh, and right. That is industry. fantastic. That is fantastic news, but let me give you the bad news, all right? I don't know, Aditi, uh, I've lost the screen here. So can you bring the screen up back uh, and the presentation back? Because I can see uh, the presentation is not there. Yes, sir, yeah. I'm there. Aditi, uh, I can't see the screen. Yes, sir, we're working on that. We're, within a few seconds, we'll be there. Okay, okay. So let me let me give you the Gallup study and the research around this, right? When Gallup did their study, they found out globally, at the moment, only 15%, 1-5, of the workforce population come to work are engaged. 15, 1-5. Closest was Rajiv who said 10%. Um, and so, 15%. Uh, 85% of the people fall in two other categories. Two other categories. Let me give you those two categories. The almost a majority of the people fall under the second category called disengaged employees. Now, before I go to that, let me give you three things that engaged employees will have. 
engaged employees will be productive, engaged employees will be passionate, and engaged employees will have initiated. This is what you'll see in all engaged employees. Now, I want you to look at your company. I want you to look at yourself. And I don't want you to give me a response where you fall in the three categories. But, you know, I want you to see where you fall today, right? Engaged employees will be productive, passionate, passionate and will have initiative. Number two are called disengaged employees. These employees don't have the same kind of passion like the first category. They come and do the basic minimum. They come and do the basic minimum at work. And so they will just come and do what you tell them to do. They will not do anything extra. They will not ask for any extra job. They will do their basic KRA because they want to be given their ratings based on what they do. They will not take anything more than what is given to them on their plate. And they will not have that kind of connect like the first category. That's the second category. But there is one more category which is a little worse than this category. And they are called the actively disengaged employee. Now, the actively disengaged employee are also called cave dwellers, C-A-V-E, -E, cave dwellers. Let me tell you what that stands for. C stands for constantly, A stands for against, um, V stands for virtually, and E stands for everything. Constantly against virtually everything. And so they're constantly against everything in the company. You ask them, how is uh, food in the canteen? They'll say it's lousy. They'll ask you something. Uh, you ask them about the boss. They'll say, what a lousy boss I have. They'll say the AC is bad. The, the, my, my chair is lousy. I don't know why our bus does not start on time. But if you ask them how long you're working for the company, they'll say 20 years. Now, these are people whose productivity is going to be sub-zero. They neither work nor will they allow others to work. So 15% of these population are going to be engaged. A majority of them are going to be disengaged. And then a large portion of these employees are going to be also actively disengaged. Now, this is where the worrying part is because their productivity is sub-zero and even minus. So if you really look at it, Aditi, we can go to the next slide. You know, uh, I've just got this, you know, um, graph or uh, kind of a picture for you to take a look. I want you to take a look at this and see whether you're able to connect to this. You know, daily job moves at work. Which of the faces are you able to connect? And my question there on top is, has this changed with the COVID situation? Because you know, you and I know, heart of hearts, all of us know that, you know, the worst day for all of us is a Monday morning. It's the worst day for us to get up in the morning, dress and smile and go and tell everybody, hey, what a great company we're working for. If you actually take your selfie when you get to your gate and get into work on a Monday morning, I want you to go and take a selfie on, on a Monday morning. Take a look at your photo on a Monday morning. Some of it looks like you're going for a funeral. It's that bad. You know, I mean, you are telling yourself, oh my God, I love to look at the same boss once again. I love to do the same job again. I love to sit in my same place once again. I love to eat the same food once again. It is terrible. And I love that face on that Monday morning. I just love that face. Look at that lovely face. And now let's look at, uh, you know, maybe a Saturday. Wow, look at that. Look at Sunday, man, at the beach. I just love that photo, Sunday. But look at what happened at Sunday night. Now, the issue is, for many of us, it doesn't have to wait for Sunday night. It is also going to be uh, that it is now moved to Sunday afternoon. I don't know whether it's true for many of you. It is true for a lot many people that after a lovely biryani or a lovely kebab and great food on Sunday afternoon, you're going in for your siesta, you hit the bed. And when you hit the bed, all of a sudden, there's a dream and a vision of somebody that you don't want to see. You can see the picture of this person. You know this person. You don't like this person. This person is asking for the report that is due on Monday. And so your Sunday is also messed up because now you're preparing yourself for the Monday. Have you seen that happen? Now, how do you beat this? The only way to beat this is to be in your area of passion, is to work in your area of strength, is to identify your area of talent. Because if you don't get there, you will hate your job, you will hate your boss, and all the time that you will be talking to everybody in the office will be gossip, negative stuff, and you're going to be very, very less productive. And so this is a challenge that we have. 
And then let me quickly go on. I see the time is running by. So Aditi, you can move on to the next slide. I just want to share with you what, uh, what is happening in our world. And uh, uh, the world around us is changing rapidly. I know a lot of comments are coming in on, you know, on, on the chat. And I'm, unfortunately, I'm not able to see all of that. But I know it's coming up and popping up. Maybe at some point in time, we'll take them as questions and move on. The world around us is changing rapidly. And that includes work too. So let me give you, uh, I think you can go to the next slide, old ways to new ways of developing people. Look at the way that the old economy worked. You know, the old economy for many of us, people like us, you know, who are senior guys in the system right now, for us, everything revolved around the paycheck. It was CTC. What is my CTC? What is the CTC that you're going to give me? Even if I get a new job, that will probably be number one. But you see, in today's world and today's economy and today's young generation, they are not just looking for the paycheck. They're also looking for purpose. People want to work with work that's meaningful to them. They just don't want to come and do something which does not make meaning. The second thing is satisfaction. You and I came for satisfaction. And if I'm satisfied a little, I'm okay. But today's young generation, today's people coming to work are not looking at satisfaction. They're looking at development. They're looking at um, not just frivolous perks, but can I develop in this place? Can I learn something new? I want to learn while I'm working. Is that possible? And uh, they want to sort of invest in their natural talent, talents and make it even more successful. The third thing about us was boss was everything. You know, the word boss was everything. The boss was the ultimate guy. We looked up to the boss. The boss had all the answers. But today, that word boss seems to be moving out. And so it is no more the boss kind of uh, term, but you're looking for somebody who's a coach. We're looking for somebody who's a mentor. People want managers who can coach them to understand and apply their Clifton strengths and value them as people and employees. They're looking for somebody who can invest into them. Today's young people, are, are, are they're not opposed to somebody who, who invests in them. They, they don't want somebody who just tell them what to do. But they also want to bounce back ideas. They also want to challenge ideas. If you're only one-way track, you're going to lose young people. Try that with your young children at home. And you know exactly what I'm trying to tell you. Right? Uh, the fourth thing is reviews. Reviews was the old ways of doing things. You know, we do it once in six months, once in, once in a year. Now we do it every three months. But that's not enough. The, the today's generation needs daily conversations or conversations whenever an incident happens. You know, Ken Blanchard is the one who made this whole one minute manager so very popular. And he talked about one minute goal setting, one minute praising and one minute reprimand. You know, you need to do all of this, you know, constant communication, constant communication with your people. And that's what you and I need to do. There are two more points and other you can go to the next slide. And one is, you know, if you really look at the old ways of handling people, we always used to focus on weaknesses of people. We always used to focus on the weakness. Uh, but today's world is not looking at you telling me the weakness. Please tell me what my strengths are. What are you going to do with my strengths? How are you going to develop my strengths? I'm good in this area. Are you going to invest in me? Are you going to send me for a certification? Can you make me better in this area? I want to invest myself in artificial intelligence. I'm, I'm good at this, but I want to move into AI. Uh, I want to move into my, you know, machine language, but can you help me? Right? They're not looking at just weaknesses. They're looking at strengthening their strengths. And lastly, many of us came for a job, but today's world comes for life. I see people even in Reliance, you know, Reliance, we've got some of the best setups. Uh, you know, we've got the best of gyms. We've got the best of playgrounds. We've got football, cricket. We've got tennis. We've got shuttle. All of that provided for employees. So you can come early, as early as 7, 7.30 in the morning, go and play a tennis, go and have a shower, or maybe even before that, go to the gym, and then go to take a shower, come back fresh and join work. They have life at work and they want authentic relationship at work as well. And so this is what is happening at the workplace. So if you are still in the old ways of managing people, you're going to lose them pretty fast. And they will go to other places where they moved from an old way to a new way of developing people. And so let me bring this now to a kind of a close in terms of what I want um, to say. Uh, let's move on to the next slide. And I'm basically given a quote here. And the quote here is, the greatest investment you can ever make is the understanding, is in the understanding of yourself. The greatest investment you can ever make is in the understanding of yourself. You know, the problem with many of us is we want to understand somebody else. We want to understand why the other person is behaving the way they're behaving, but we don't even focus on ourselves. The greatest investment you and I can make is to I see what am I? What am I bringing to the table? And so, how do I do that? 
Let me give you two things that you can do. Number one, in my next slide, is this whole assessment called the type assessment. And I'm sure many of you have done the MBTI, sorry, the MBTI, and uh, it's called a type assessment. I'll tell you why it's a type, right? Uh, I have a small exercise for you. So let's go to the next slide, uh, Aditi. And I want all of you, if you have a book in front of you, please write this line three times. I use my strengths every day. Please use a pen or pencil and write this three times in a notebook in front of you. Now, if you've done that, I want you to shift your pen to your other hand and please write the same statement three times again. If you're a right-hander, move the pen to the left. If you're a left-hander, move the pen to the right. And please write the statement once again, saying, I use my strengths every day. I see Aditi being very, very faithful and trying to write, so good. Okay, I think I've made my point. What is my point here? Now let's look at the next slide and the next slide summarizes what it is. So Aditi, if you can move to the next slide. When I asked you to write this with your natural hand, right, what happened? It was a preferred hand, right? You did not think, oh, what day of the week am I at? Did you think, did you have to ask that question? Or did you have to ask, what time is it? I think it's somewhere close to 7.45. I normally use my other hand to write. No, you just wrote with your natural hand. And when you wrote with your natural hand, it was easy, it was quick, you didn't have to think, it feels like you, it was comfortable. For a long time, it came naturally to you. That's what happens when you move into the natural things or preferential things or a preference. Now, what happened when I asked you to shift your hand and write with your other hand, which is your wrong hand, and which is a non-preferred hand? It was awkward, it was slow, it was hard to concentrate, it feels slightly alien, soon it becomes uncomfortable, and with practice, it can probably start feeling a little better. For example, if I tell you from today for the next six months, I want you to write with your wrong hand. What do you think is going to happen in the seventh month? Seventh month, you're going to be much better than what it was today. It'll be much better handwriting than what it was today. You'll be much more comfortable. And that's what happens to every one of us on a day-to-day -day basis when we come to work. There is something that comes naturally to us and we got to move into that as quickly as possible. Because everything else needs expending of energy, time and resources. And it's going to take you a long time to learn. So you got to understand that there is an easy way, a quick way, and I, it comes naturally to me. And I need to get to moving to that. And that is what MBTI basically gave us. It gave us the whole concept of preference to non-preference. And let's move on to the next slide. And, and MBTI, most of you know, basically gave you those polar opposites in four areas. And you'll see those four areas here. The, how do you naturally get preferred to direct and get energy? Is it to extroversion or introversion? Do you take in information by sensing or intuition? How do you make your decisions? Is it through thinking or feeling? Or uh, how do you organize the external world? Is it through judging or perceiving? Now, I don't have time to get into all this, but I'm sure most of you HR professionals have already done this at some point of time. If you've not done an MBTI, uh, you know, I would encourage that you do an MBTI step Q, uh, which is a good investment for you to understand who you are and what, what you have in terms of preference. Um, and so that is something that you need to invest in. So that MBTI is a type assessment, and I'll tell you what that is in a minute. Let's move on to the next slide, and uh, if you do the assessment, you'll have 16 personality types that will fall under, which is our next slide, and you'll see the next slide all. I am an ENFNP. That's my type, ENFP, and I think that's the best in the world. Uh, no, I'm just joking. Uh, that's not right. That's not right. There's no best and there's no worst. You'll just fall into one of the 16 types. Aditi, are you able to move to the next slide? So let me move on to the 16 personality types there. The second assessment that I want us to understand, one is a type assessment. The second assessment is an assessment called the trait assessment. Now, this is where StrengthsFinder falls under. It's a trait assessment because it goes deeper than a type. 
Trait goes to the DNA of a particular person. Trait goes even more deeper. And Strength Finder 2.0 uh, is, uh, yeah, is something that you need to sort of get doing yourself. If you have not done a strengths assessment on yourself, please invest in it. It's a great assessment. It's a great investment. You will not, uh, you know, you'll not regret having done an assessment because it just gives gives you fantastic results. Uh, it gives you top five. It also gives you a full report of thirty four. And I would I encourage you to do the full thirty four because being a HR professional, you need to have a full thirty four report. And uh, what it gives you. Uh, as you can see on the slide, you can go to the next slide, uh, uh, Aditi. Basically, it says Strength Finder is not just a book, it's a movement. Why do they say that? Because 19 million people worldwide have taken the strengths assessment as of now, right? What happens when you take a strengths assessment, right? It gives you your top five strengths. For example, if you do a top five, I shared what my top five is. You can go to the next slide, Aditi, and it'll tell you uh, by countries. What are the top five uh, by a country? For example, you'll see India there, right? Right on top, India. India's top five is responsibility, relator, learner, restorative, and achiever. Now, you may not know what it stands for, but uh, it's amazing that number one strength of people in India who've taken the strengths assessment is responsibility. What does responsibility say? If you give something to a particular person and tell them to do it, they will do it. You can just sleep over it because they have taken the responsibility to, and commitment to having completed it. And so that is number one strength. Now, if you have somebody working in your team who has got number one responsibility and you've given them the task, you don't even have to follow with them because they are responsible and they will give you the result. Now, can you imagine if you understood all the strengths of your people in your teams and you can leverage the right person to do the right task? For example, there will be somebody in your team, you'll see in the India, there's some, something called learner. You know what a learner is? Learner is somebody who, who loves to keep reading and learning new things. I mean, they'll have a mini library at home. Their phones will be constantly full of podcasts and books and stuff like that. They're constantly wanting to be in the learning edge and the new technologies and new things. Now, if you want to do a research on a latest project of what's going to happen for your company, who are you going to turn to? You're going to turn to the learner because he'd love to research or she'd love to research and come back with a paper. And that's what happens when you know the strength of a particular individual working in your teams. And uh, on the next slide, what uh, strengths does uh, you know, have done is they have, so there are 34 talents or 34 teams, and they bucketed them down into four distinct domains. The first domain is a domain called executing domain. Now, these are the people who can get things done. You give them a task, they will get it done. Influencing domain are the people who have the power of communication. They can stand up and take an idea and communicate to the rest of the world. The third domain is relationship building domain. These are the people who can hold a team together. They're the essential glue of holding people together. And the last is strategic thinking. These are people who look to a tomorrow. They're futuristic. They're ideas. They're always looking at what can be done tomorrow rather than what can be done today or yesterday. Now, you will be able to find out which is my top domain strength. What's my top? Where do I fall? You know, for me, my number one is relationship building and number two is strategic thinking. For me as a manager, I think that's fantastic. I can hold a team together. I can get the best out of team because I build relationship with my people. I invest in people. I take time to listen to people. That's my strength. I'm also somebody who can look into tomorrow. I'm not a person who look at yesterday. I don't look at my today also. I'm always looking at what can be done. What new ideas can we do over and above what we already have? I'm a futuristic guy. I strategically think ahead. That's my strength. Now, if my boss understands that this is my strength, he should be leveraging me or she should be leveraging me in this space. Now, if he does not leverage me and if he does not use me, I'm going to be disappointed. He or she is going to be But if my boss understands that John is great when it comes to strategic thinking or great when it comes to relationship building and leverages me in the space, I'm going to be productive. I'm going to be the best because I'm in my area of strength and my talent and I'm going to give the best to the company. That's how beautiful strength is. So let me just wind this down and then we'll probably open it up for some questions. Let's go to the next slide and tell us the difference between type and trait. You see, type assessment, which is an MBTI, tells you how you are similar to a certain percentage of population. That's an MBTI. MBTI tell you, John, you're ENFP, you are 
similar to 16% of the world population. But a trait will tell you how you're different from everybody else. It doesn't tell you how you're similar. It'll tell you how unique you are from everybody else. In, in fact, 19 million people have got reports which tells them that they are different from everybody else. Can you see how beautiful that is? And let me just give you an example and then I'll close. Let's go to the last slide. Oh, last but one slide, the penultimate slide. It just says, assuming that you did it, and I also have it, assuming that, say, Aditi and I have done the uh, assessment, and Aditi's got her top five, and she's also got a 34. And I've got my top five, and I've got my 34. If I line up Aditi's top five, and I line up my top five, and if both of us have the same top five, but not in the same order, I will be the 275,000th person on God's earth. Let me repeat that again. I and Aditi have done the assessment. Both of, us have, both of us have the same top five, but not in the same order. If that happens, if that happens, I will be the two like seventy fifth thousand person on God's earth. Let me move one step further. I line up Aditi's one to thirty four. I line up one mine also one to thirty four, and both of us map one to one. You need to understand. That's what you need to understand, and so. I just want to finish with the last point or last slide here. You know, my coach and my mentor has, uh, for a long time has been Anand Pillai and he made a statement that has resonated with me. And this is the statement he said, God has made us unique. Don't die a cheap copy. God has made you and I very, very unique. Don't die a cheap copy. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure talking to all of you. I hope this was useful in the time that we had. Uh, I'll leave this back to Aditi. Uh, maybe we can take questions via chat rather than a voice. So if anybody has a question via chat, let them ask the question. I think that'll be better so that we... Um... Thank you, Manisha.